Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. If you're enjoying these podcasts so far, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're listening on and leave me a rating and review. This is really helpful and allows me to keep producing good content by drawing more of the top names in the industry to the show. Also, sign up for our newsletters on our website. I'm going to be releasing a compost tea white paper and a bunch of new content here in the next few weeks, and it's the best way to find out right away when new episodes come out. This is part three in our series with Jim Bennett, also known as Clackamas Coot on such forums as IC Meg and Lumper Dogs on Grass City. He's an organic grower and gardener who has helped many people in improving the way they garden and move away from bottled nutrients. Now, before we get into the interview with Coot, I wanted to take a moment to address something I've been hearing about for the past month or so. There are some self-proclaimed cannabis consultants out there that worked with Dr. Ingham and have a series of biological tests where they applied a neem seed meal or neem cake tea to the soil, and they claim it affected the bacterial to fungal ratio of the soil in a negative manner, allowing an increase in disease-causing microorganisms. They also claim it kills beneficial fungi and nematodes while increasing ciliates. I've heard growers are literally throwing out their soil over this, and to me that is just crazy and I wanted to address it. Here's what I would say in response, and then I'll have Coot comment as well. First off, I've done microscope testing on neem cake and aerated compost teas. That information is freely available on YouTube, and I've added it right on the podcast page so anyone can take a look for themselves. The person in question did not use a high-quality neem cake for the test. The products that we use and carry are of the highest quality, and we did a lot of research before bringing them in. We never recommend making an anaerobic tea with neem and kelp in full power. The ways we recommend using neem cake is to add it to your worm bin, mix it into your soil mix, or aerate it and use it as a soil drench to combat fungus gnats. Anaerobic teas are always going to be high in bacteria and ciliates. That's common knowledge in the compost tea industry and why we maintain dissolved oxygen in aerated compost teas above 6 mg per liter for the entire brew cycle. These tests are only from one individual and have not been replicated by anyone else. Based on this fact alone, I wouldn't draw any conclusions. And the fact he is having people throw out perfectly good soil in an attempt to make neem into this catastrophic soil amendment is just ridiculous. I believe this individual is just trying to make a name for themselves so they can get consulting work by attacking someone like Coot. They didn't even isolate for a controlling variable, meaning they mix neem cake, kelp, and fulvic acid. Based on that, one could just as easily conclude that it was the kelp or the fulvic acid or something else caused by the combination of ingredients. There's no way you conclude that neem had a negative effect based on that alone. And just because someone shows you a soil test or a lab test doesn't mean that it's real science. When I first heard about this because people were sending me messages on Instagram, I went over to the guy's page and took a look. I posted my YouTube microscope link as a way of sharing more information and to hopefully start a discussion. At that point, I was really interested in seeing if his claims were true and learning more. Instead, he promptly blocked me and deleted my posts. Then, in private messages, he told me I'm just a bizarre old man and to go hassle other kids. Now, first off, I don't think I'm that old. I mean, yes, I do turn 40 in a couple of weeks and my knees are starting to feel like they belong on a 60-year-old. But in all seriousness, no legitimate researcher would delete data or not welcome an open discussion. I found it really telling that he was more interested in controlling the dialogue around the discussion and neem than actually working together towards a greater understanding, which is what science is really all about. As far as I'm concerned, based on what I've read so far, I'm throwing this into the category of fake news, as the politicians or media might say. That is, at least until we can get more data to support anything he is saying. Keep in mind that neem has been used for literally thousands of years by farmers as a means of improving their soil. All I see here are some lab tests with no controlling variable, a low sample size, poorly sourced inputs to which this so-called consultant has drawn conclusions that just aren't proven and go against all the other existing research. Lastly, let's not forget that the plant can control the microbial population in the rhizosphere based on the exudates it puts out and cannabis appears to prefer bacterial soils like other annual crops. But I've talked enough. Let's get Coot on here and see what he has to say. Hey there. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Ted. I appreciate it. I uh, didn't read the gentleman because he blocked me several months ago because he did a bogus test on this, the so-called uh, Coots mix. So 
the science out of that individual for me is incomplete and generally inflammatory. And again, trying to promote some kind of a, an agenda for uh, consulting work. But let me clarify one thing. The neem tree as a part of human health goes back at least 12,000 years. And all parts of the tree are used uh, in different ways, of course. The bark, the leaves, the berries, and the roots. And then, of course, the oil and meals. As a crop amendment, it picks up at about 8,000 years ago. And in the 90s, you remember this, I mean, at least reading about it, uh, W.R. Grace tried to grab control of the international neem market. And it isn't just India that produces uh, neem oil and meals. And the case went all the way to the uh, World Court at The Hague. After spending $800 million because of the work of uh, Dr. Vedanta Shiva, which you know is behind the dirt movie titled Dirt, she's the one that led the cause. And W.R. Grace wasn't successful. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I've read two, these are academic books, uh, Neem, a treatise, which is uh, four PhDs. They're the actual authors. Of course, they reference a body of work that goes back to the 1800s as far as science. And then the uh, big one is uh, the Neem tree, which was, I, I can't try to pronounce his word, it's German. But he arrived in the Sudan after graduating from Cologne University as an entomologist because there was a locust disaster going on in the Sudan. And so when he arrived, he noticed that the neem trees weren't affected by the uh, locusts. So he spent the next 35 years studying neem, uh, finishing up in 1993, and then put his research together in this book, The Neem, the neem Tree. And it also references over 500 scientists and 200 research institution, and then something like 20 governments and their body of research. Going back, like I said, to the 1800s, and then more recent research that he and other uh, contemporaries were involved with at a number of uh, institutions and research organizations. The neem tree is found in over 72% of Ayurvedic preparations. And at that, I really don't have much more to say. I mean, any of us who have used neem, and I'm probably one of the original in this discussion going back at least, what, 12 years? Because when you and I met, I was already firmly established using meal and oil and then picked up karanja around the same time. And you've seen my work online and in private photos that I've sent you. Do you think I'm, is there something missing here? No, Jim, I mean, your plants always look really nice. And haven't you also been in contact with a lot of other growers over the years who have been using neem as well? Yes. And I would even venture to say, well, I'll just leave it at hundreds. All right, enough on that subject. Let's get back into our interview with Clackamas Coot, talking about seaweed and kelp. If you want to really know about kelp, Dr. Michael Geary G-U-I-R-Y, who's a uh, uh, Irish, uh, see, in, consider one of the leading experts in the world on marine algae. His uh, website is seaweed.ie, which is Ireland. And if you hit the nutrition tab uh, on the menu, he compares the three types of marine algae. There's red, green, and brown. The one we want is brown. You mentioned the one that comes out of the North Atlantic on the West Coast. It's not as harvested, and I wouldn't use it because of the sheer amount of traffic, ship, the shipping lanes out of Asia. But uh, Laminera digitala, bladder rack, if you will, uh, the ones that create the uh, kelp forest that are really critical to uh, marine mammals for high and young roe hiding places from being eaten. Brown kelp produces some compounds that are not found in any other plant on this earth. The big one is alginic acid. 
<clears throat> and within the last 48 hours, you've probably taken some form of alginic acid at least five different ways. And that's a whole nother research. It's really fascinating how much, how alginic acid is used. But these are compounds that you, you can't replace. And we can replace nitrogen in a number of ways, like you mentioned. You got comfrey, you got alfalfa. I mean, there's a lot of things that have uber levels of nitrogen. But things like alginic acid and fucodian and some other compounds, those only exist. And you can see the side-by-side -side comparison of the three uh, varieties of marine algae or uh, groups, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, red, green, and uh, brown. Brown's the one we want. And the red one is the one that has the collagen that's used as a thickening agent, as you discovered on the uh, rooting uh, process. So that one, I don't know that we'd want to use that in our soils. And green, well, you can see for yourself. The side-by-side -side is really fascinating. And he's got some incredible photos. And he's written uh, three or four books on marine algaes around the world. So if somebody really wanted to learn about kelp, that would be a good resource without buying a book. Because the library repository is extensive and complete. So, Jim, just to change directions really quick, I would, I would love to have you back on the show at some point. But one thing I wanted to, uh, I thought listeners might really enjoy, would be a little bit of your history in regards to uh, the one in that story. Oh. I don't know if any, if anyone's actually heard you tell that in an audio version. Well, it was not, it was not, okay, the one came about, it was a stupid, it was a joke. There came a time that I needed money. The indoor thing was just really getting going. And I lived in Laguna Beach for many years at the, during the day, heydays of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, what Nixon called the hippie mafia. They were responsible for bringing in tonnage that you probably or your listeners wouldn't believe, but this is one of those times where government officials probably told the truth. And they were also the ones that marketed the psychedelic uh, uh, orange sunshine. But anyway, I had seeds. That my first seed, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't a grower. I was only 19 years old. I got some seeds from Kandahar, Afghanistan, right before I got drafted. I was hiding under the bed screaming, no, send the women and children first. Yeah. Anyway, I had to go off to save the world for democracy or something. And then it was 40 years ago this past Christmas, the first load of uh, tie sticks came in. And uh, so that summer, 40 years ago this summer, I did my first grow. Well, we did. There was several of us. And Sensamia wasn't even, what? What's that? So this was the old style, man. Plant them. And I didn't know anything about newts. I don't know if you said there were newts, even miracle Grow, But I knew you had to water them. And we had a well. So anyway, we made some stupid money. And a few years later in 84, this group of ne'er-do-wells that I hung with, they wanted to get involved in this growing. So one of them had an uncle or a grandfather, something like that, that had some greenhouses. So we took the Kandahar seeds and we did an open pollination to get a good genetic base to work from. And the same with these IBLs now, tie seeds from these, uh, the first tie sticks. So anyway, long story short, we whittled it down. I whittled it down to 10 plants and they came over to my house that day. And this was a, you know, a goodbye party. Hey, have a good life. Please don't call me kind of thing. So I had the plants arranged against the wall in my uh, den, the most sativa, to the most, the one that had the most indica expressions. And since I had done all the leg work, I grabbed the most sativa and I said, the one here, this one's mine. So somebody made a joke about, oh, so you got like the one, huh? Is it like, and so anyway, as a joke, I named it the one. Not that, oh, like, you know, this is like the best in the world or anything like that. Well, I made the mistake of writing about that on IC Mag one night and all of a sudden, oh yeah, the one, man, I want to get the one. Yeah, it's a good plant, but it's, you know, it's just, I just kept it around because I had better things to do than, I only bought seeds one time in my life, and that's all I needed, okay, to see that where this was going to go, and that was 30 years ago. I bought them from Neville, the Hayes Northern Lights. Now, remember, being in Laguna, there were loads coming in from all around the world. These guys were real criminals. This wasn't, oh, yeah, you know, I got a half pound. I mean, these guys were talking about, you know, container loads of hash, if you can imagine that. Containers. Uh, there's a good book called uh, Orange Sunshine, the story of the hippie mafia. 
you can find it online, excerpts uh, that appeared in the Orange County Register. And uh, these guys were crazy. I mean, they once rented a helicopter in conjunction with the Black Panthers and yanked Timothy Leary out of federal prison up in Lompoc, uh, north of Santa Barbara. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's kind of money they had. It was insane. So anyway, that's how the one came about. So all it is, it's a Kandahar male and then a Thai, Thai stick sativa. And this was the most uh, sativa that I could find out of this. Because we started out, by the time we were ready to start really investigating, we had 100 sativa plants and 100 of the uh, Thai plant. And we whittled it down to 10. And I got this one. There was another one called Blue Orca. I didn't name any of these. These were all named by the respect, most of which I never saw again. There was uh, Magic Crystals. Uh, there was uh, Mary Poppins. You know how kids are. They just name stuff really stupid, you know. So anyway, that's how I got stuck with the one. And what's funny is, is that by today's standards, because, you know, we now breed for size, right? That's the big, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, tomatoes, it's all about size, right? Forget flavor, who cares? Sure, yield. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yields because, you know, what drives everything, because consumers don't care. I mean, look what they buy in a grocery store and call it called tomatoes. So as far as a commercial plant, I wouldn't recommend it because I, I couldn't handle the crying and the whining. Well, you know, I only got, you know, fill in the blank. And for me, this wasn't a lifestyle change. I had a, you know, a, a daughter to raise. I had other things in my life going on. But just growing some plants under a light was for my own personal use. Now there's a guy here in Oregon. He just took a plant and named it the one. And they've got T-shirts and keychains. I mean, he's dancing. And, it, you know, the thing's a joke. I didn't do this because I didn't care. But one of my friends that on Instagram, he used to be uh, known as Cool Kush, he had it tested and posted from the one of the labs here in Portland. And he had to take it down at 63 days. And I usually recommend 84. So that's another reason people, oh, that's too long, man. You know, whew, I'm not going to wait, you know, 12 weeks. But even at 63 days, he rolled in at almost 27% THC. And I know that if you took it to how long I would do, my record's 18 weeks. But even at 12, I know it would be over 30. I mean, I hear people around the trade here that they're talking about selling stuff to the dispensary that's 21, 22. That seems kind of weak to me. <laughs> I mean, I want to feel like, you know, somebody hit me in the, my forehead with a fist, like Mike Tyson, you know, when I smoke. I don't want to. It's not about, uh, I'll really make some people angry, but I don't want like high school weed, you know, the stuff, you know, ooh, it makes you giggle. You know, let's, let's get some uh, THC rolling here. You know what I mean? Well, I, I know some people who have taken that plant that uh, you've, you've shared freely um, with a lot of people. And uh, I know Bill took it like 70 or 80 days once and he just said it was it was a little too strong for him personally um oh yeah I've, I've never heard anyone who's ever tried the one ever complain about the quality or the flavor or any of the effects um it seems like you have a pretty amazing plant there on your hand hey you know what it's called see i don't call myself a breeder because i have some integrity and i, I would hope that other people who call, do call themselves breeders might want to take that advice you know to be a breeder means you're a geneticist. And just because you took Bob's Kush and crossed it with Harry's Haze doesn't make you a breeder. It just makes you, you know, you're just throwing crap against the wall and see what sticks. And I'll be the first to admit, man, this whole thing was with the luck of the draw, LOTD. I've never made a claim that I'm some great breeder. I'm not. But, hey, you know, it's better than the crap I bought from uh, Neville. I can tell you that. I was shocked. Shocked. Because remember in Laguna Beach... At that time, you could find people that had seeds from uh, India, Sri Lanka, the g really good so Ohaka. In fact, I was talking with Tim Wilson one time about Ohakan Spears circa 1978, 77. The stuff of legends, uh, true lamb's bread. Now kids just they grab a name and go, here, we're going to call it this. Oh, okay. I've asked these hash or, uh, Kush experts, have you ever been to the Kush Valley? Well, no. Oh, so you really have no idea what this is, then, right? Well, no, oh, okay, but it sounds cool. How can you how can you not like something that you know sounds really exotic? There's definitely a lot of uh, hyperbole. <laughs> yeah, and myth, and and it's really hard because this was a essentially a illegal plant for so long that 
finding out the actual history of it is, is really, really tough when we talk about genetics. So that, I think that is a challenge. It is. And you know, I, I, to me, it doesn't matter. You know, if, if, if people feel better about themselves because they grow dim, dumb, you know, cush, Hey, have at it. I don't care, but it does. They're not going to impress me. And I always ask, well, how good is the weed? And not to a person. Okay. When the whole cush thing got started, really big. There were three of them. This was like circa, I don't know, 2005, 2006, something like that. And so I got a card, not because I needed permission from the state of Oregon to grow weed, but I wanted access to these after you get a card groups because you could freely exchange, you know, meat and because it was legal, you could exchange cuts and seeds or whatever. So I went on this campaign to find all these strains that I'd been reading about that I was just a fool because I wasn't growing. And most of them never made it past day 28. A lot of them didn't make it past day 21. Because, I I mean, I've been growing for 40 years, so I kind of knew where this was going, right? I mean, I don't have to finish a plant to see if I want to keep it. And uh, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, one, one plant in particular, and everybody I've talked to has agreed with me. I won't even name it because it doesn't matter. I said, have you ever used that many bamboo sticks on any other strain? And they all started laughing and go, never. I'm not joking. I mean, I'll bet you I had 10. This is in a 10-gallon pot. I'll bet you I had to use 10 bamboo stakes with zip ties to hold the thing up. Well, that isn't genetics. That's just silliness. And one strain that's really popular, when it, when it first showed up at IC Mag a few years ago, I seriously, seriously thought it was a joke article from The Onion. I mean, the structure was that bad. And yet it became a cottage industry with several derivatives. I just, I don't know. I, I mean, There's as much marketing around... Uh cultivars now as there is around bottled nutrients and of course there is growing so yeah i will freely give any genetic i have away but you got to be in front of me because i'm not sending it and i ain't driving it anywhere but in oregon i can legally give anybody plant material and be in compliance with the law both the medical laws as well as the uh the recreational laws they implemented see i don't know if you knew not everybody might know this but oregon when they decided we already had we were one of the early not first but one of the earlier states to have a medical plan uh i think it goes back like 20 years and then the recreational thing after some stumbling came into being recently and last year or two whatever well any household not person but household any household can grow four plants so it's really changed the dynamic here in that regard and so i I showed you those pictures the other day of using uh, the Rockwell cubes with my formula. And I always have more cuts than I can possibly use, and I give them away. I, it's not a big deal. I mean, you still got to have, if you want to grow, you got to have good soil. And I guarantee you that 90% of the people that take them wouldn't even know what that term means. So, you know, and they're going to be disappointed, and that's okay. You wanted it, here it is, you know. I can't grow good tomato plants in miracle Grow, so I'm not even going to try with other plants. That's just kind of the way I am. I like, uh, I, plus I like control. Like you said, you want to know what's in a product that you're going to use. Well, I'm the same way about my soil because I, I physically mix it myself and I, I don't deviate. I use the same materials and the same proportions and that way I get consistent results. And that's also how you're able to test all of these other products because that's right. you only have changing one thing at a time and you know this plant so intimately from growing it for 40 years. Yeah. Now, I do have a daughter, another Thai plant from that era. Actually, I got this one in 86 at a 4th of July party with a friend, rest in peace. We used to call him OPH, our personal hero, and uh, Mr. Cool. And he had this party every year. And so this was some guys that uh, were in the seed uh, group of the Brotherhood. And they did a lot of business with, uh, you might have heard about it where you live too, Oregon and Washington, the Sacred Seeds, and then the uh, Consortium out of California. Anyway, they were supplying seeds. And so he brought these seeds back. He goes, this is the Velvet Rush. And he didn't know anything about it, so I planted it. And I went, oh, yeah, that's a Thai plant. And so anyway, we crossed the, uh, I had a friend in Hawaii because, this is not the best area of the country to produce seeds because of our weather patterns. You want to see mold? Yeah, do a seed plant. So he crossed the uh, velvet rush with the one. And the problem is that I showed you some pictures of those giant plants. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's not what most people need, but one of the people that I gave the seeds to found one that's really manageable, and we call it Agnes Cut, and I think I, that's the name of my dog. I think I sent some photos to you, but this thing is just, it's got the mass of the Velvet Rush, but it has the resin set of the TO. and uh, this is my first run with it, and I got to tell you, man, it's just, I'm almost giddy. I've never had a plant produced like this. And, and I ran into Brad March from March Biological, and I bought some uh, green lace wings. As sometimes I think they're called, you know, emerald lace wings or whatever. Talk about an effective uh, pesticide. Jeez. Decimate them. And the advantage is, because you're dealing with the larvae, they don't leave like ladybugs do or others, because they're adults, they're mobile. These aren't mobile. And it takes about three weeks till they uh, mature, and you get enough for six plants for eleven dollars. I mean, would you spend eleven dollars every three weeks to take care of six plants in a personal garden? Of course you would. No spraying, nothing. That's great. I didn't, you know, I was always a doubter because I, you know, over the years I've tried indoor and outdoor ladybugs, and like, who doesn't like ladybugs? I mean, they're pretty, right? But as far as a stick around predator, they're worthless. <laughs> I mean, outdoors, boom, they're off to a new uh, adventure in a couple of days. Whereas these, the larvae, they can't fly yet. They not only eat the organisms, they eat their eggs, which is really exciting. So you're breaking the, uh, you can't use them outdoors if it gets cold. You know how it is in the Northwest, what, three weeks ago we had temperatures down in the 30s. So, you know, you got to reapply or uh, when it warms up. But by, say, the end of June, certainly, I'm going to be having these tags hanging on all my tomatoes and other plants. One of the reasons, the problems here where you and I live west of the Cascades, okay, this has been a big nursery area going back to the 1880s. And you know how, the, I mean, you've been in the big nurseries, Monrovia and, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of acres. You talk about monocropping. I mean, have you ever seen, you know, 50 acres of arborvita? It's really depressing uh, <laughs> that you would sell that many, right? So, Around the world, there's like 3,800 species of powdery mildew. And in a study by OSU in conjunction with UW Puyallup, they identified almost 10% of the entire world's total west of the Cascades. So you can see some of the challenges we're up against. And the reason for that is that when you're in the nursery business, to stay in business, you have to offer your customers new plants, right? And new plants come from where? Somewhere else. So everybody comes along for the ride. Mites, mildew, you know, I mean, on and on and on. So we have challenges that you probably wouldn't have, say, in Southern California. I mean, you might, you'd have other problems like white flies, but you probably wouldn't have some of the uh, incredible levels of powdery mildew that we deal with. And that was what got me onto neem is that it wasn't until I really started studying how to use neem correctly and the emulsifying and all the other things. I can now say without any caveats, I've been mold-free for nine years. And I also practice IPM. So for some people, IPM means, oh, I saw something, I better spray. I mean, you got to spray every week. That's just the deal. And you got to have good soil because the plant itself can ward off most diseases if you've given it the tools. And the tools are what we've been talking about, comfrey, kelp, and in my case, neem meal, for those that don't choose to use it for whatever reasons. But all those things add to the dynamic and the quality worm castings that consider this. The first like legitimate science research of worms cast, uh, castings didn't occur until 1974 in Germany. So in many ways, we're really on the cutting edge of what this entails. And I, there's a book by... He spent 65 years, has two doctorates, one from uh, Oxford, one from uh, Ohio State, Dr. Edwards. His book, Vermiculture Technology, is actually an anthology of about 30 articles from different writers around the world. And it was Dr. Edwards that developed the vertical flow through, which I had built. Uh, Dan Holcomb at Oregon Soil Company, he's the one that he and Dr. Edwards put their heads together and built this. Yes, it's state-of-the-art. Would I recommend it? No. Get a smart pot. It's far easier. 
you got complete aeration. You don't have to feed it so much this week. Because the idea is that you feed from the top and harvest from the bottom. It's not the idea. That's how it works. So your big producers like Worm Power in New York, they have all vertical. But that's, you know, you're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars that were invested in that factory. We're trying to do some for, like you said, 200 gallons. Well, that's a yard. Just think of everybody set up a 200-gallon smart pot with some quality, you know, material and added some amendments that we've discussed. And just a couple pounds of worms. I mean, think about what that would do to the gardening dynamic of the tomatoes they grew, the flowers, uh, you know, roses, uh, whatever you like, lilies, whatever your thing is. There isn't a single plant that's not going to benefit from the quality of the worm castings. And what makes worm castings different from thermophilic compost is that the vermiculture process is driven in large part by enzymes. The worms not only have enzymes in their digestive tract, they also release them from their skins to trigger specific microbial responses, just like plants do. I mean, you know more about this than I do, but plants release exudes into the soil, right, to trigger uh, nutrient uh, uptake or to, uh, you know, whatever instruction sets from the brain center in the taproot. So plants have two brain centers. One's in the meristem, and the other one's in the taproot, and which is why topping a plant makes no sense whatsoever. Talk to anybody who's ever topped a plant, and I'll tell you if they're honest. Well, yeah, I lost about 10 days until it got back online. But you can bend it, and you still create the same hormone that you're wanting to see to get lateral growth. Just those little sec- not secrets, just those little, that comes from owning a nursery. The last thing I would do is go out there and, you know, be topping plants. I mean, wh- why? There's one thing is shooting yourself in the foot. It's another to take your shoe and sock off to make sure it's a good clean hit when you're trying to grow japanese maples that are going to sell retail for thirty five hundred four thousand dollars why would you do stuff like that you wouldn't so don't top your plants tie them down i think the kids call it lst low stress training okay as opposed to super cropping you know when i first got on these weed boards i had a, I had a, a fellow there a younger guy that had helped uh in real life so I'd send him an email. Okay, so what's LST? <laughs> or, uh, okay, what's super cropping? The one that cracks me up, though, is sea of green. Okay, the Chinese developed what the kids call today sea of green 4,500 years ago. They were also the first society to figure out rooting on a massive level, rooting a cutting. Okay, so that method was taken up by the French, and then it was called the French Technique. And then Alan Chadwick, a Brit, a master organic gardening type fellow in the 50s, he called it the French, not biodynamic, bio... Biointensive? Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, then one of his students in the 70s, or late 60s and early 70s, John Jevons at the Ecology Action Center, he modified it again, and he wrote the book, the title something like How to Grow More vegetables in the smallest amount of land possible and it all was raised beds in uh, five by 20 foot beds and you would plant them really tight on center and that would then reduce evaporation it would also limit the ability for weeds to get all those things right Mm -hmm. and uh so it's in fact that's where i first started 40 years ago i went to his school a week-long school in northern california and to learn biointensive then in the late 80s, some, there was two magazines. One was High Times and another one was uh, from Tom Alexander, who I, I think you've met. He had one called Sensimia Tips. And some Yahoo in Amsterdam, yeah, we got this new method, man. It's called Sea of Green. So I'm reading this, you know. I'm going, what do you mean you invented this? What are you talking about? So anyway, Sea of Green became, well, it was... Those uh, weed growers are really smart guys. What do you mean? Because they stumbled on a document or a manuscript out of China? I mean, come on. So uh, they take credit for everything and have done nothing, you know, kind of thing. But I practice that, in, like, especially with strawberries, where you want really healthy strawberries. And you know how strawberries are, especially the varieties that we grow here in the Northwest. Like down here, we grow a lot of hood berries. I forget the one that you folks have that's real popular up in the Seattle area. But 
you know, with uh, strawberries, you want to keep a fairly hydrated soil. Not sopping, but, you know, the roots do better, whereas tomatoes maybe wouldn't want your soil at that level. And by the biointensive uh, method of planting whatever it is on center, you can. it's easier to maintain that. You, you, I have a copy of his book in PDF if you want it, John Jevons on biointensive. It's really fascinating. I mean, a lot more work than most of us are going to do, I can tell you. But uh, you can feed a family of four and something like a thousand square feet. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll check it out. I think I've read some of the square foot gardening and some of those those things. Yeah. Okay. Well, they they I, I I don't like using that word. I wouldn't say they copied them, but yeah, they borrowed a lot of the biointensive from Chadwick and the French and John Jevons. And he he still runs the ecology center, still a learning center. People still go take his classes. And I know it's not popular, and this is one area that I kind of disagreed with some of the professionals about, don't disturb the soil. Well, okay, but I, I practiced biotensive where you do the double dig method, and I did really well. Maybe it was wrong, you know, because of the fungal thing, you know, yada, yada, yada. I found it to be in a very effective way, and also to check your soil. Where, where, where's my worm count at? So the I still I don't necessarily do it because of health reasons, but I would still recommend double dig to those who are serious about learning a a method of, of farming that goes back several thousand years. I mean, you know, come on, there's something to be said for a tried and true, right? Yeah, I'm a big fan of it. I, I don't think it's fair to compare tilling with uh, digging a bed. It's not the same thing. So uh, right, I, I'm all for digging an indoor bed or, or a raised bed versus going strictly no-till. Now, I know Tim Wilson feels otherwise and others. This whole no-till thing has really taken off. But I, I posted an article on our, our blog on Kiss Organics exactly about this topic because it was something that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, and I for reasons that escaped me, I've been tagged with the no-till thing, and I've never made a post, good, bad, or indifferent, about no-till. I have opinions that are probably counter to the urban legends, but that's completely different from the wheat that I buy is from a family co-op over in eastern Washington and some families in eastern Oregon, Shepherd's Grain, and they practice no-till. Well, that's a whole lot different than growing in a container. I mean, you and I had this discussion with Tim was involved too. Like, what's the difference between horticulture and agriculture? And they're not the same. First of all, I don't care how good you are. I consider myself pretty good, but I'm not. I recognize that there are shortcomings in an artificial soil that we might build. We, as hard as we might try, it's not the same thing like, like you and, and your family's uh, garden. I've been pumping comfrey on these beds for eight years now. And also, sometimes I'll take my garden soil, potting soil, and I'll apply it on top. I've got it where I can stick my hand and my arm almost to my elbow down into the bed. And when I dig around and look for worms, I mean, there's just a mass of worms. Okay, and according to the experts, I'm doing it wrong. You know, I shouldn't be... And I, I mean, I do some other things. I don't plant the tomatoes in the same bed every year. And I wouldn't call it crop rotation, but... You know, you establish a, the colony of problems in that soil and to some degree. So do a squash plant there next year or, you know, uh, peppers or whatever, you know. And then uh, I plant, I do a lot of uh, beans because I like them. I like stir fry, like uh, what they call bush beans, green beans. I like stir frying them. So, and that they also add to the tilt. But basically, my whole program is kelp meal and uh, some neem every year. And that's pretty much it. And then, uh, oh, yeah, worm casting is about, I put a skin on, like, like maybe uh, an inch, inch and a half, just to get some biology going. You know, or do, especially after this winter, what, the worst record in, what, 75 years we went through in the Northwest? Oh, for rain? Uh, yeah, it was rough. No, snow and ice. Oh. I mean, well, that too. But, yeah, I mean, this was the hardest winter. I, I've been up here 30 years, and I was you know, thinking about maybe moving back to – Southern Cal, this was horrible. I mean, I want snow where I can drive to it, like up at, you know, Mount Rainier. I don't need it in my yard or driveway. I can't get out of the house. And I, you know, I had a three or six month old bulldog. That was fun. Well, yeah. Well, Jim, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat today. I feel like we got to cover quite a few subjects, and I know there's a lot more I'd still love to talk to you about, but uh, maybe I can have you back on again. Oh, you bet. Yeah, it was fun. I, uh, yeah, I like talking about, you know, stuff that I feel I've, uh, I wouldn't say perfected, but uh, 
got into a level that I feel comfortable telling others how to, you know, like the worm castings and, I mean, how simple it really is to make a worm bin. And, and what I bought a hundred gallon for twenty four dollars, hundred gallon Smarty for twenty four dollars. It's not a lot of money. And of course, thankfully, I got a donation of the black leaf mold. I mean, you know as well as I do. I mean, you, you guys have been making compost up there at your farm, family's farm, for years. You can't beat black leaf. I mean, if you want really like super turbo plants, this is the stuff to use. Yeah, I hope there's some growers out there that will take some of this information and try out some of these ideas and, and hopefully not only save money, but also improve the quality of their soil and health of their gardens moving forward. That was Jim Bennett, better known in online forums and Instagram as Clackamas Coot. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. Stay tuned for future podcasts from leading experts around the industry. And don't forget that there's all the links related to today's talk available on our website at www.kisorganics.com. And if you're enjoying these podcasts, please take a moment to leave me a review on iTunes and send me your feedback and suggestions through our website contact page. Stay tuned for our next episode with Nelson Lindsley of Poetry of Plants. I'm really excited for this one. Nelson is a cannabis consultant in California who has been in the industry for over two decades. He drops some awesome knowledge regarding hybrid programs, pesticides, and how he's getting massive yields over three pounds per light using a combination of organics and chemical nutrients under LEDs.